In this episode, I meet up with an old friend visiting from Lisbon. We talk about the year he spent working and living in 12 countries in 12 months, visiting 61 countries with a group of 75 strangers who became his best friends. He talks about the nomadic lifestyle and walks us through ways to work remotely while living or traveling abroad. Welcome to the Flower Lounge, a place for conversations with wildly creative people and a little plant-loving wisdom to help you experience life in full bloom. I'm Katie Hess, flower alchemist and founder of Lotus Way, and I believe in a world where we're all living at our personal edge. Welcome to this week's episode of the Flower Lounge. I'm really excited to be sitting across from an old friend of mine, Sean Tierney, who, let's see, I think we met five years ago, and it just so happened that he happened to be in Phoenix, even though he currently lives in Lisbon. And we carved out a little time to, to do this podcast interview. So I'm really excited. Sean is a director of sales and automation for Pagely, which is a managed WordPress hosting company. I'm just going to say the way that I know Sean is he just is like brilliant at all things business and computer related and coding and SEO. And if he doesn't know someone, he know, if he doesn't do it himself, he knows somebody. And so we work together to that capacity few years ago. Um, and then he completely disappeared. And he essentially traveled to 24 countries in the last two years, uh, had a ton of amazing experiences that we're going to talk about. He is now currently host of Nomad Podcast. And in his free time, he goes kite surfing. He loves music. And he does, oh man, how do you call this again? Krav Maga. Krav Maga, <laughs> which is an Israeli form of self-defense, which also we're going to talk about. So cool that you could be here with us. Thank you. I'm so glad it worked out. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we figured we, we probably saw each other. Like, when was the last time? You left the I, country in 2015. Yeah, maybe three years ago or mm -hmm. two and a half years ago. So, yeah. So what, what was going on three years ago that would make you just, like, pick up all of your stuff and leave the country? Yeah. And you essentially haven't come back. No, I haven't. Well, I've been back a total of, I think, two weeks or three weeks like <laughs> since then. So yeah, I really haven't. Um, you haven't been longing for the U.S. soil. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, that's a whole conversation, I guess. Um, no, I can, I can tell you a story. Like basically, uh, so I have a job that allows me to work remotely. Uh, the company for which I'm director of sales, Pagely, um, our entire staff is remote. And so um, it's just a really nice, uh, everyone works from home, uh, great setup. And I was working from home out of my apartment and did that for about a year and then realized like, oh my gosh, I can work anywhere. Why would I do this? You know, I should be like driving around the U.S. and connecting with a bunch of people I haven't seen in a while. Um, so I looked into that and I started planning that road trip. Um, but the deeper I got into doing that, I kind of realized just the overhead associated with organizing that and, you know, getting the next stop and then planning where you're going to go next and driving. Um, it just wasn't going to be like, I wouldn't be productive for them. So I kind of ruled that out. And then about the time that I shelved that concept, um, a buddy of mine who I literally just hiked Squaw Peak today with, ironically, um, had gotten accepted to this thing called Remote Year. And he did not have a remote job at the time. So he had reached out to me. He was living a block away mm -hmm. at the time and came by my house and just one night kind of laid it on me. He's like, hey, I know you got a remote job. How do you do it? Like I got accepted this thing. And he's describing it. I'm like, holy crap. You know, he's asking me if he should do it. And I said, well, number one, yes, absolutely, you should do it. And number two, I'm going to do it with you. <laughs> and so I applied that night and got in and he and I ended up traveling for a year together. So what is Remote Year? Yeah, so it's, it's basically a work travel program. It takes people who all have their own jobs and they come together. And so total strangers sign on to this thing and then you know basically they're committing to travel a year together without knowing each other <laughs> which is like the hardest thing to do right oh people always say that when you you don't really know someone until you travel with them yeah but it, <laughs> in, in, you know they call it a tramly a travel family <laughs> like it's like the affectionate <laughs> nickname for this but it really is it's like you don't choose your family and you don't choose these people that you end up traveling for a year with but by the end of it you're so close because you've seen everything right and it's you go through just these incredible experiences and challenges together and tragedies and celebrations and everyone has a birthday. And it's just like this amazing, like communal experience as you see the world together. And so I, it's, it's like nothing else I've ever done. It wow. was probably the single most transformative thing I've ever done. You know, that's so interesting because I was an exchange student both for a year when I was 16 in high school and when I was 21 in college. 
in Germany and then in Spain. And, you know, when I was in high school, we lived with host families. When I was in college, we lived in our own apartments. But I remember, you know, there was always like, kind of like, you know, it was exhilarating, but also sort of like, what the f am I doing here? Like, yeah. I could, and when I was in Germany, there were a bunch of us who had won a scholarship and we'd meet up a few times uh, during the year and we were just like electrically became close and almost like what you're talking about, almost to me sounds like a more fun, healthier experience and way to travel versus just like plunking in totally alone and isolated and having to kind of fend for yourself. You at least kind of have this built-in family like you said yeah exactly and it's easier to meet local people when you have people that you already know and you can go out together and you know there's some mutual interests and you can all decide to go on a hike together and you know it's just everything is easier um, not to mention like they coordinate all the logistics for you so it's nice like you don't have to worry about flights or accommodations or workspace or any of that stuff activities they organize all that so it was a really it was an amazing like gateway drug to be able to do this kind of thing so you pay a certain fee and they yeah. basically just like handle your lodging and yeah what about food uh you're responsible for your own food you're responsible for your yeah. own food so they give you a place to stay and work yep yep and you go to a different place every month Yep. Yeah. 12 cities in 12 months. Um, they handle all the flights between the cities. So you literally just, you show up, you get yourself to the first city and then they kind of take over from there. <laughs> so like walk us through your 12 months when you were abroad, where did you go the first month? Yeah, yeah. So we left, I guess it was May, 2015, 2016, Anyways, May. We started in Prague. Um, so that was incredible. Cool. That was our first city. It was amazing. We called it Disneyland. <laughs> Um, started there, went to Belgrade, Serbia after that. And literally, I'm ashamed to say this, but I could not have put Serbia on a map prior to that whole trip. I just, I had no idea. I didn't know what Serbia was. So that was our second stop. Um, and when you say second stop, that's for a whole month? For a month, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, third stop, we were supposed to go to Istanbul, Turkey. And we ended up, uh, it was around the time of the airport bombings. And mm -hmm. they, uh, they routed us wisely because it was actually that month that it happened. Um, but they routed us to London. So we did a month in London. Uh, our fourth month was in Lisbon, where I now live. Uh, fifth month, we did Morocco. Uh, lived in the capital, Rabat, Morocco. Uh, Valencia, Spain. And, oh, interesting. Uh, yeah, which was beautiful. Then we went to South America, did, or we, sorry, Mexico City, Bogota, Medellin, Colombia, Lima, Peru, wow. Cordoba, Argentina, and ended in Buenos Aires. Um, and so did your friend ever figure out a job that he could do remotely? Well, yeah, he did actually his, so he was working his family business and it was just a question of if he could do it remotely because he'd always worked in the office. And so he was asking my advice on how you make that transition to start doing your work remotely. And did he transition successfully? He did. Yeah. He worked the whole year. Uh, he also launched a side photography business, which he now transitioned. He does videography and photography. Wow. And so that was like, his whole mission was to like make that his year of actually leaving his his family business. Wow. What she did. Wow. Yeah. So any particular places that you have had especially fond memories of or that kind of uh, struck you in some way that surprised you? Yeah, for sure. I mean, Lisbon, like obviously the place I now live, uh, I, I had not ever once thought of going to Lisbon, let alone moving there. Right. So this was, uh, that was probably the most transformative thing. It's just my favorite city. What do you love about it? I've been to a Porto, but I've never been to... Porto's cool. Um, I, yeah, there's so much to love. Lisbon, so I try to not actually deconstruct it. I've, yeah. I've really tried to just soak it in and say, like, I just love this place. But if What's I the had feeling to, you have when you're there? It's just, I don't know, every morning is just fresh. And, like, the food there is super organic and good. And the water's right there. And there's something just, like, the way the cobblestone streets... Like, it's not a master planned thing. It's the second oldest capital city in Europe, right? Athens is the only older city. So it has just like this incredible history. You know, the castle is still there and the Moorish walls and like just the, the different regimes that took over the city. It's been taken over like four different times by different groups. So it's just, I don't know, it's got this a ton of history and soul to it. And, you know, 
yeah, just you everything. Love the people, apparently. The, the people are great. I don't yet speak Portuguese, unfortunately. I've <laughs> been kind of uh, slag, slacking on that, but <laughs> I'll learn. Obrigado, that's probably way. <laughs> Obrigado, vinho verde, uh, pasta de nada. Like, I know the important, the important words. <laughs> I just actually, it's so funny. My parents, you know how, like, your parents will give you random stuff from, from when you were younger? Like, they'll dredge something out of the closet and be like, here. Yeah. And my mom just gave me a pile of photos and postcards, and one was from my trip to... Porto and I and I I just like literally just read this postcard over the holidays and I said something like I feel so silly because all I can say is obrigado but we just smile and say obrigado to everyone in every store. <laughs> it's, it's kind of the multi-purpose <laughs> word yeah it's like I use it sometimes for sorry like obrigado <laughs> sorry hi thank you you're thank awesome you. I love this <laughs> it's all obrigado <laughs> yep that's so great um and then like any places that you were just like oh for some reason I'm just like having a rough time here yeah um not because you want to blame it on the place but just like yeah. it just something cropped up and you were like oh this is so hard yeah well Morocco was a tough place not I mean it was it was amazing in the sense that it was very different from anything I've 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 known um culturally we I very much felt like an outsider it's not somewhere that I could live but it's a place that I'm really glad I got to see like how many people get to go and live for a month is a complete stranger but then start to immerse in a community and you know meet people and all that so um, Morocco was uh, eye-opening uh, and then the, that next month Valencia like I said it was uh, in terms of a down month that was probably my lowest uh, Trump had just won the election and we had just come from a Muslim country where we made a bunch of Muslim friends. And now all of a sudden, like days later, there's a Muslim ban, mm -hmm. and, you know, and it was just like this weird, almost surreal change. And so a lot of us had just a really off month that month. And mm -hmm. it was, I don't know, it was depressing. And you're, there were 75 of you together. Yeah. How quickly did you, so you get together, you're in, uh, Prague was Prague. Person, yeah. How quickly did you guys start bonding? I think it was immediate. I mean, they did a really good job of kind of orchestrating, you know, events. Like you say, they create connection and commonality and all that. So uh, we just, I think when you take 75 people and just transplant them, you just have this instant bond because what else are you going to do? So yeah, we just, I think immediately hit it off and we lucked out. We had like some of the most amazing people. Uh, Remote Years had, I think now 32 groups. So we were group number four. Um, so we were early on for them and I know every group probably says that they had the best group, but like we literally had the best group. We, <laughs> yeah, like, if there's any indication there was 26 staff members, I think that flew out to our farewell party. Wow. So it was like, we had pretty much the whole company at the time <laughs> came to, to see us off. Like it, it was an amazing crew. And so what were the other folks who are in your program? What kind of jobs were they able to do remotely? Yeah. So there were, I'd say a smattering of developers, designers, uh, marketing agency people, pre like PR folks. Um, we had a finance person um, and then writers. Yeah, we had kind of a mix of stuff. You know, people like myself and probably I'd say half the people had full-time jobs and then maybe 40% were either freelancers or entrepreneurs on their own. And some people just didn't have a job the whole year. You know, they tell you you're supposed to have a job, but some people did it on savings and just had no intention of getting a job. They just <laughs> traveled the whole time. <laughs> so, yeah. Wow. And so you would just, I mean, just like in your own life, creating discipline, you, you would just create the hours that you wanted to work and then you create your off time. And Yeah. Well, so there was a common workspace that we'd all go to or most of us would go to. And uh, yeah, we just kind of figured out the hours was an interesting thing to get used to initially because, you know, go to Prague and immediately we're like seven hours offset from the core team, uh, which in hindsight, I think was a good thing. It, it really, it forced some issues. It, uh, it caused us to hire a couple people that I don't think we- You mean have, in your own company? In, in my company. Because there'd be like a, a delay in, in responding or something. Yeah, well, it made it very obvious. Like I was doing a lot of roles at that time. It, it was early and you know, I forget how many employees we were at the time, but you know, I was doing a number of roles and I think it made it clear that that was the case. And so it kind of forced that issue, which then had the, the beneficial effect of getting us to hire, help. cleaving off that. Yeah. Yeah. And giving me some space to then actually do what I'm good at, which is the strategy and building stuff. So. Mm. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. And how did you not like, 
I mean, 12 cities in 12 months. How did you not just like, ah, screw work. Like I'm going to go explore Buenos Aires. Well, so 12 cities was where we were based, uh -huh. but then I learned a term that I'd never heard before, which is called side trip. Okay. <laughs> to me, I've only ever taken <laughs> trips, right? But now you, your whole year is a big trip. So you, right. wait, you had side trips. Um, so I actually saw 61 cities total. So it, yeah, it was a whirlwind. We saw, we covered like an incredible amount of ground. How do you even have time to work? Or you're basically just like well, you, living in the city, working, but then in your free time, enjoying the city. Yeah. So here, here's the thing. Like there, I don't know the technical name of this physics law, but there's something about how like a liquid will always fill the volume of its container, right? I think that you will inevitably end up taking over, you know, taking up however much time you have. And when you do something like this, it really constrains, it forces you to be efficient and to think about, oh yeah, I want to go see that castle today. So I better get X, Y, and Z done. And this other thing doesn't really matter. So I'm going to skip it. And so it really, like, that's another beneficial kind of like unforeseen byproduct is it, it, it puts a very fine point on what's important and it just makes you laser focused. So mm. that was great. Interesting. And what did folks back at home at Pagely, at your company, like, did they reflect back to you anything about like your style of working or like any, did they, did they notice any difference or, I mean, obviously they knew you're abroad, but. I mean, if it's any testament, I think whatever Morocco, I think that was our fifth month. Um, yeah. My boss tweets out something, you know, when your head of sales has a record breaking month and is a digital nomad in Morocco, nonetheless, you know? <laughs> and so it was nothing but positive encouragement. And like, I guess I felt an obligation to them because they let me do this and they had the trust to not let them down. So, you know, I did, I, I was a lot of times the last person in the workspace, you know, making sure that yes, we're still getting everything done that we needed to do. Um, so yeah, just, they, they kind of extended that trust and then I made good on it and it just, it worked out. So was that hard when you got to the end of the year? Like I imagine you were, you got, you formed such tight bonds with this group of people and then you all fly to different places or go home? Yeah, like, it was super hard. It was super emotional. Uh, I'm not a particularly emotional person usually. <laughs> and that was just a really, uh, I will never forget our last day together. And just, I was the very first one to leave because I just it, like leading up to that point, you know, we had like 10 days of <laughs> goodbyes and celebrations and whatnot. And so we were all just like kind of this blur of emotions. And I just remember that last day, I finally just reached the point like, I gotta go. All right. And so I just kind of left yeah. real quick and hugged everyone and like, yeah, it was, it was super, super emotional, but uh, yeah, it was hard. Uh -huh. Bonded quick. And then as quickly as it happened, then you all disbanded. Time passes so quickly. I can, and I can't even imagine how much faster it would move if you're, if you've been through 61 different cities and oh, it's, 12 months. It's stupid. It, it's, we say that like remote year has like this time warp effect where simultaneously it seems like sometimes you'd be like, oh my gosh, like this is taking forever. Like this is like, we a whole year ahead of us. And then you look back and all of a sudden it's over. And so it's like this very weird, like fast and slow time thing. Um, something about traveling like that, that it just, yeah, it's, it messes with time. Right. Wow. It's like, you're so aware. You're so acutely aware. Cause every time you get to a new place, your eyes are so wide open and you're just like taking it all in and you're yep. so in the moment. Yep. And so it seems slower, but then suddenly but yeah. then, yeah, like, the density, though, I think, like, I've always said that the, I, I judge periods by, like, the density of memories. I think that's, like, a good gauge of when you know you're living right. You know, when you just look back on something, it's like, oh, yeah, and that, and that, and that, and that. And it was, like, we would make more memories in one month of remote year than I had, like, in the previous year of my sedentary life. <laughs> and so, yeah, I think that was kind of the thing that when it was all over, I wasn't ready for it to be over. I was kind of, like... I want to keep doing this. And so I did some solo travel and continued, just kind of made my way up South and Central America. And where uh, did you go? Uh, so I went to Chile, or actually I went to Mendoza directly after Buenos Aires. So you said goodbye to everyone in Argentina? Yeah. Or in Buenos Aires? Yeah. Well, there was actually another group that was coming uh, on our heels into Buenos Aires. So I stuck around. Uh, we had kind of befriended them. Uh, we went to Carnival together in Colombia. <laughs> And anyways, so stuck around, hung out with their group, um, went to Mendoza. And then from there, I just went off on my own and did Santiago, Chile, and then Costa Rica, Nicaragua, uh, Dominican Republic, back for a wedding, and then posted up in Mexico City while I got my visa stuff to move to Lisbon. And what made you choose to live in Lisbon versus come back to the U.S.? Um, that was the place, a couple of reasons. Um, 
getting the visa isn't actually super difficult. It's annoying, but it's not hard. So uh, it was, I did a lot of research. Uh, it was a place probably that I liked the most. So it was my favorite city. And it also just happened to have a really favorable visa program. Um, the tax setup was favorable. And it's just like a good portal to Europe. You know, I wanted to, I don't know if people know Schengen restrictions, but like as an American, you can't just go travel Europe for six months. You actually, uh, if you're not an EU citizen, they have this thing called the Schengen zone where you can only do 90 days of the last 180 in the Schengen. And so that makes it complicated if you want to go explore Europe, then you have to you're constantly like hopping in and out and trying to make sure that you're not overstaying your Schengen days. Um, so yeah, being based in Portugal, I'm now resident. I'm covered under their healthcare. I'm, Whoa. Yeah, I have essentially a European passport at this point. I can go anywhere really? with no Schengen restrictions. So it's really Whoa. nice. Yeah. So are you fully, like, wait. I'm not a citizen. I'm a resident. Resident, Portugal, resident. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. Awesome. Like having a resident card. Yeah. Wow, that's cool. Yeah. That's What's really the healthcare nice. system like there? Um, I mean, I haven't had Pretty to awesome. use it. Knock on linoleum. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's uh, it's good so far. Um, you know, there. I would say there's definite dysfunction in terms of their processes and getting things like a driver's license and whatnot. You, it makes you appreciate how uh, ironed out all that stuff is here. Uh, but yeah, once you have it, it's no problem. So. I remember because I lived in Madrid for a year, and when we'd pop over to Portugal, I just remember like damn why are the roads so bumpy here like i don't yeah. know if it's still like that maybe it's not anymore but i just remember so many potholes it was like such an adventure every time we were driving on the roads like trying to avoid the, the, the <laughs> is roads, it still like that no the roads or at least the highways are amazing now they're there. amazing we uh this is another story like so my friend and boss josh strebel whom i think you know from pagely um, he came out this summer and we, we rented a stupid supercar this audi r8 and drove it from lisbon to madrid and the roads were just insanely good so it's <laughs> we, we we tested that out and proved that they work very well and what was eating like any like amazing foods that you tried that were just like wow mind-blowing i'm in another country yeah well so we were talking before like in the last two months i've gone pescatarian and that's the place to do it um, lisbon's the seafood there is amazing so i would say you know like there's everything seafood whatever you like it's there and it's amazing oh. um, other than that like food around from remote year I mean, every country has something amazing. interesting yeah yeah I, I, it's hard to pinpoint one thing and if you think in terms of like inner personal growth like it's always fun to talk about food and sites and stuff yeah. like that but what were say like one, two or three things that like really stretched and moved you on the inside during that year? Like yeah. uh, irregardless of where you were externally, like what shifted, what happened during that year? I mean, the best description I can say is that there are certain muscles which don't get exercised in like just domestic life. Yeah, you know, I, I'm born and raised in Arizona. I've lived here most of my life. And it's a great place to live, but until you go to all these different places and figure out what you don't know, you don't know, like that you, things you take for granted that like things just work in this way and that, you know, or like going to get a passport is going to be straightforward, you know, things uh, until you actually see the brokenness in some other places, it doesn't, you just don't appreciate the, what you have. So like, I think gratitude was a muscle that got for sure, you know, I, I have a lot more of it now. Um, resilience I think you learn to be very adaptive and just like oh well the water doesn't work today <laughs> like we'll figure it out you know? <laughs> so there's just like some ad adaptiveness uh, muscle that you learn to develop in all those scenarios uh, I think patience it goes along with that you know you just learn that some things take more time it's not going to happen as fast and oh well come back tomorrow you know <laughs> so yeah it's things like that they're just like virtues that don't get tested or stress stressed enough in places where things are just too convenient i guess so mm. i think that was the the thing that changed most hmm. and what's the end result of that like what kind of person are you if you experience more patience and resilience and gratitude i think you're just less I don't know the right adjective for it, but like less brittle or less uh, Not so well, jostled. Tight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you just kind of can roll with just about any scenario. And I think it, it's tough to extricate what, you know, or attribute 
if that was all remote year, but I also did a lot of like, I did the headspace meditation that whole time. Uh, and that was actually my, I did, I've done it for three years now, uh, but like really deepened that practice. And so I think some of that is probably responsible for it. Uh, but all those things, like the confluence of all that was that it just like I became a more like patient kind of resilient person, I think. And you've been practicing meditation every day almost for the last few years. Yeah, not flawlessly. I mean, I well, forget sometimes, yeah. right? But um, yeah, no, for, th- for three years now. Yeah. And you said you were working with Headspace, but then you transitioned to something else? Yeah, I felt like, so Headspace is an amazing way to get into it. Um, I had actually tried transcendental meditation. I learned that uh, many years ago and it didn't stick. And I've used this analogy before where it's like, it, same thing happened to me with an instrument. Like I had initially tried to learn violin and that didn't stick and piano didn't stick. And it wasn't until I discovered guitar that I finally found my instrument. And so I think the same is true with meditation. Like not every form of meditation is going to be like what resonates with you. Right. And so if the first one doesn't work, don't just give up on meditation. Go try a couple other instruments and see what is your instrument. Right, right. And Headspace, something about like the guy's voice and the format and the way the app works and everything. It just, it got me doing it and it was pleasurable like right from the get-go and so I kept doing it and uh, but I felt like I capped out at some point with that particular system and so I was like well what else is out there so Mm -hmm. um, went out and explored I checked out like calm.com didn't couldn't stand the narrator of that so I (laughs) I got right off that Uh, but I know I settled on a different one I can give you the link to it but uh, it's I've been doing that now it's just a different teacher and a different you know set of exercises wow that's very cool yeah what would you, what would be like, what's a piece of advice that you find yourself commonly these days sharing with people, like words of wisdom or insight or just like words from the heart that you often find yourself sharing? Hmm. I mean, it's so context specific. I don't know. It's tough for me to like it, think it, of one. It, just it, when you're put on the spot like that, what would be? I heard it was actually even before I left for remote year, but the words stuck with me and it was, it was some conference here in Phoenix where the, the woman was talking and her word she said is like, every, it's just a season. And like the way that she said it and in the context of like, just like going through a hard time and something that too will pass. And it was just like, like those words, like it's just a season um, coming to really internalize that and start to see seasons of ups and downs and all that. Um, I don't know. I would say that's like words that stand out when, if I'm put on the spot to think of like one solid piece of advice is just like the way the woman said that and how it's kind of resonated sense is. It's funny when you say that, I think of like, it kind of hits me because it's like life is just a season. It's like, it passes so quickly. Like it brings to mind the, the impermanence and the sort of fragility of everything and how quickly it passes. Yeah. Um, what do you think about that? How quickly life passes? Yeah, and just like how our time is limited, how there's like a limited time period. Hmm. Um, I mean, if it wasn't limited, it seems like there would be no constraints. And I feel like constraints breed creativity and kind of constraints make you adapt and learn and grow and all that. So if it was unbounded, I don't know that it would be as interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it's like your remote year. You had to have the end so you knew like right. how awesome it was. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, if you, cause then if it was unbounded, I guess you could then literally do everything, but there would be no pressure to do everything. So would you truly do everything or would you just kind of like <laughs> knock it out of bed in the morning? Cause you're like, I can do it later. I can, I can do, do it tomorrow. 5, years from now. Yeah. Yeah. So no sense of urgency. Yeah. <laughs> cool. There was one exercise that um it's funny i totally forgot to do this we always do this exercise at the beginning um so we can edit it to be at the beginning if we want to but um if you close your eyes and you go back to a time in your childhood when you played around flowers or plants or trees as a kid um just see if you can think of what you were up to who you were with if you can identify a favorite flower or botanical and reflect on the three words you would use to describe its personality Hmm. and whenever you're ready just like share everything about what you're thinking well i mean so this is interesting like we grew up my brother and i grew up in a house that had 
something like 56 orange trees in the backyard. Whoa. And so the orange blossoms, like when you ask that question, the, the thing that immediately comes to mind is just, you know, playing in the backyard and the, the orange blossoms there. And in terms of a personality of that, that's a good question. It's, uh, it was just, I don't know. It's very like exploration, formative, like alive growth. Those are the ones that come to mind. Hmm, cool. So what we find is that the way you would, the words you'd use to describe the quality of your childhood favorite, um, describe the way that you bring your greatest gifts into the world. So explorative, <laughs> formative, alive, and growth inducing. <laughs> <laughs> Seems pretty spot on. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's interesting because like all the time that I've known you, you've always been like, a pusher like you're always on the edge you're like the first person doing like customized video sales choose your own adventure and no one else is doing it yeah. you know so you're always like way out there on the edge trying new things yeah. digitally and and in the business world so it makes sense that you would be doing that on every level yeah yeah oh, that's a really interesting exercise <laughs> i wonder what your mom would say <laughs> yeah no, we should find out i'll ask her that question i'll let you know <laughs> um okay so tell me more about kite surfing yeah, kite surfing is something I learned in the Dominican Republic. And it is, for the people listening that don't know what it is, it's basically think like windsurfing, if you know that sport. Only instead of holding a sail, like a fixed frame sail in front of you, you're actually controlling, you have lines to a kite that's flying like 30 meters away. And so, yeah, it's, it, it's a really magical sport. A huge sport. kite? Yeah, like I have a 12 meter kite. So Whoa. It's a pretty big That's thing. That's massive. Yeah. 12 meters? Yeah. Well, so you That's use like a 36 feet? Yeah. yeah it's, a, it's an enormous, it's like wow. a giant parachute. Wow. And so this thing is what powers you. And so then it's essentially like wakeboarding at that point. You're on a board. You're getting pulled by this thing. How the heck do you get it up into the sky? Run. No, no, no. There's like oh. a whole way to launch it. So okay. you, you, you hold it basically kind of perpendicular to the wind and then you bring it up in it just you fly it like a kite the same way you would like launch mm -hmm. a, a kite kite so yeah no it's it's just a it's an incredible sport I've always liked wind sports I used to do paragliding um, this is just like the right mix to me I love water I love uh, I love the wind it's it's all the skill of sailing with the you know like the extreme and an exciting point like being able to jump whenever you want just bring it back and pull down and you fly off of a wave like so it's just got these magical elements to it and there's like no motor you're just quiet out there you're just you and the waves wait so are you lifting off the water yeah i i flew <laughs> the last time i did it in la ventana <laughs> i on my last day i just i was asking i was like how do i how do i jump and so she's teaching me and just tell me okay this is what you need to do and you bring it back and pull down and and i just yanked on this thing and i flew like 30 feet and smacked pretty hard and like definitely was like overdoing you know pushing my limits and kind of was like okay i need to take this slower but oh my gosh this is amazing like i'm definitely gonna learn how to jump <laughs> the right way and not do it so crazy again but yeah so not just kite surfing but kite flying yeah <laughs> <laughs> yes that's awesome and then um tell me more about the kramaga Krom oh, kramaga kramaga yeah, yeah so this is something i learned uh Self-defense has been something that is important to me, uh, just given I had an episode a long time ago in high school uh, where I just got my butt kicked and uh, didn't want it to happen again. So um, I had learned Taekwondo, which is kind of worthless for self-defense. Um, it's a very like forms-based system. Um, and this was what I discovered. Uh, I don't even remember. I just did a lot of research and found it and then found a guy who did it. And long story short, um, it's a really practical Israeli-born uh, self-defense system that like every, down and dirty it's well, or the, like the, a really technical uh, I wouldn't say technical like there's a uh, it's a methodology by which the goal is to basically uh, incapacitate the opponent and then get out so mm -hmm. you're just mm -hmm. doing the least amount of damage but very swiftly and extreme damage to then get out mm -hmm. And so I'm not a belligerent person, but like, I just, uh, I don't ever want to be attacked again. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. Peaceful warrior. Yeah. <laughs> Only go. attacks when promoted. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> You're prepared. You're prepared. And then um, tell us more about the Nomad podcast. Definitely. What inspired that? Obviously your remote year. Yeah. So the, well, I mean, so I had such an incredible experience on remote year that uh, I started telling people about it and 
when I worked in Mexico City, I was working next, like side by side to a lot of the people who are basically the salespeople for Remote Year. And so hearing all these repetitive phone conversations and the questions that people are asking, I was like, I can just record a course and it will just do this one thing and it'll answer all these questions and it'll help you get prepared. And so I built the course you know, like for that purpose, thinking, okay, this is like perfect customer development. I know exactly what the questions are. So boom, built the course. And um, then there's just like, I was like, okay, this thing exists now, but now how do I get people to do it? And so the podcast just made sense as the next step. Um, so I did 14 episodes of that. It's actually on hiatus right now. I paused it until I'm, I'm locking up some other things with the model to make it all work. But once that's uh, up again, I will absolutely keep doing it because I love it. Um, but yeah, no, I interview nomads, uh, founders, and domain experts. And so anyone, I think these three groups of people um, are the three different groups who can help people make this transition. And Repeat them again, nomads? Yeah, nomads, uh, founders, so like product and program founders, and then um, domain experts. And when you say founders, you mean founders of specific programs that help people become more nomadic or travel? Yeah, I, I so, well, those, yes, program founders and then also like product founders. Like if there are certain products that I think are super helpful, then I'll interview them. And the third one was? Uh, domain experts. What does that mean? Uh, so I think there's certain things like generic high level topics like nutrition, uh, wellness, um, you know, self-defense, sleep, um, information, security, like things that we deal with as nomads, subjects uh, that bringing on experts in that field to kind of answer questions and help them be more effective at it. And so this is for not only the person who's like going to how many different cities in a year, but maybe just somebody who wants to take a trip for three weeks and they want to get some extra travel tips or. Yeah. I mean, it's, I think there's certainly lessons that can be valid for people wherever they are. <laughs> Sorry. I'm going to just slide over here. <laughs> get the sun coming in. Um, yeah, no, there's absolutely the, the lessons could be valuable for anyone, but I think they're particularly valuable for people that are intending to make this transition and be full-time nomadic. What about folks who are expats? Yeah, no, they definitely could be mm, useful. You're an expat, right? I'm essentially, yeah, I mean, I, I guess <laughs> technically I'm an expat now. I'm still a citizen, but I just don't live here anymore. And so uh, let's see, there's two, two things I want to ask you. One is, um, what is that like to transition from a nomadic life to a stationary life in Lisbon? Mm -hmm. It's so, I mean, I had been traveling at that point almost two years. And so I was ready to plant somewhere. It's, it's definitely exhausting. It's not something I think you can do indefinitely. Although I have friends who've been doing it for like five years, What? which is, yeah, that's, they like just continue the remote year. Just like, keep traveling keep on going. their own. Yeah. Or keep going on their own. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that's, I, I, I was not, interested in doing that i want to settle down somewhere mm -hmm. um uh, i'm sorry what was the it's question just like how, how does that feel settling and i guess it's like a relief now after yeah it's a relief um it is definitely what's weird about my situation is it's kind of so i am fixed now in lisbon remote year has a huge presence there so every month there's a new group and i work out of the workspace where those groups come in so i, I now meet i met like in the last year i met nine groups they came through so as you can imagine, the groups are smaller, but it's like 45 people in each group. And so that's like 400 people, you know, that I've met and got to know over the last year. And they're all inherently interesting because they're doing this thing. So it's, it's amazing. It's incredible to meet that many interesting people, um, but it's also exhausting, you know, you, and you, it, it's sad because your relationships are inherently going to be one month each. Mm. And then unless you go to wherever they're at next, you know, that's right. kind of your relationship with that person. So. Uh, but no, it's been fascinating. And I, kn I knowingly got into this situation, you know, knowing that that was going to be the case. So. <laughs> like best friends for a month and then yeah. they leave. And then more best friends for a month <laughs> and then they leave. And then yeah. <laughs> so what are some of the most interesting people that you met who were on the program? Just yeah, like a random smattering. Like tell us who, just people who like stick out in your mind. Like, yeah. when, like folks, personalities, quirks, what they did. Oh, geez. <laughs> I, just, I mean, there's 400. I don't even know where to start. Uh, you got folks from all over. Uh, so primarily, I'd say 80%, 70% from the US and then others from just all over. Tell me about the e-course that you're building. Are you going to make that available to people? And Yeah, it is available. So it's it all out there now. Nomadprep.com if you're interested in it. Um, basically, yeah. the first four days of it are totally free. And then if you want to continue doing it, then it's like $99, I think, for the rest of the course. And what will folks learn? 
So they learn pretty much everything that you need to know to do this. So we start with um, basically how I approach every problem is to start with like, what are the biggest risks? So in this case, it's, you know, getting your employment situation figured out because likely it's actually your funding source. But for most people, that's going to be like having a job that allows them to work remotely. And you mean like not necessarily, it could be someone doing remote year, but it it could could be be someone just like going to travel for six months while they work remotely. Correct. Yeah. It's not specific. Um, Actually on the very first, uh, the first day we go through all the different programs that are out there as well as solo travel as an option. And so I kind of help people figure out like what's going to be right for your circumstances. Okay. So it's even applicable to somebody who's like, damn, I really want to do something like what you did, but I'm not sure how to find that. Exactly. So I basically talk people through like a decision framework and all the prep necessary, like starting with like, what are the big questions? That's how do we like figure out the program, figure out what you want to do, you know, work it out with your employment situation or find a new job, what we need to do there, Um, you know, store your stuff, figure out the financing stuff, like how to do all that. The, I have two days dedicated to like InfoSec, like hardening your security stuff because you're almost certainly going to be working on a laptop and all that. Um, we get like gear purchasing, what I recommend for that. Um, then I have a whole day, like day devoted to memories preservation. So not just like photo stuff, but, you know, journaling and the different apps that you can use to capture this whole experience. Um, there's really cool stuff. We had a girl in our group use this thing called one second a day or one second every day. Oh, yeah. And it made the coolest artifact. Like at the end of that, you can imagine one second from every day of that trip set to music it was just incredible I'll, I'll give you the link if you want to see it it's Stunning. amazing yeah so yeah no just like basically talking through everything that you need to know to do this and like the people that have gone through it because I get to meet the folks in Lisbon you know I just people come up and give me a hug and like thank you so much like this is what gave me the confidence to make this change wow and so it's super cool to like then meet the students face to face who have gone through you know the course that you built so wow yeah. that's so cool and how do they find you um, so this is, I don't even know if I'm allowed to announce this yet. I'll, I'll, we can edit maybe, it out. Yeah, we can edit it out if it's not kosher, but I, hopefully it's announced public, so it won't <laughs> matter. Uh, but yeah, Remote Year is to, has agreed to start giving my course to the folks they talk to who are not ready for Remote Year. So either unqualified or don't really understand it or I'm not sure if they can do it. Um, so they are going to now start giving my course to those folks and hopefully, yeah, like my goal is just to help more people do this. Yeah. And so we're totally aligned in that, you know, obviously they want more people to do their program. I just want more people to go nomadic, whether it's their program or other program or on their own. And so, yeah, I think that could be a really good relationship. Okay. One last question. What is the driving force inside of you that wants people to go more nomadic? You want them to have an experience of what? Yeah. Well, so two things, actually, I, I think backing up before that, um, so Simon Sinek, I'm very much, you're nodding your head, so you know Simon Sinek. Um, This is a guy who is all about like understanding your why. And like, he has this incredible program that helps you get at that question of like, what is my why? Um, I went through it and I've put a a number of other friends through it. And my why is basically to help others beat gravity to be free to do what they're born to do. And so that is like the pithiest, most concise statement of like what I believe I'm put here. To do. I love that. Say it again. So it's to help others beat gravity so that they can be free to do what they're born to do. Wow. Right. And so gravity in the scenario is, you know, the things that would preclude you from doing this. Like to me, like I think nomadic is going nomadic is one very strong mechanism to actuate that for people. And so you know, will it, will I be all about nomadicism forever? Maybe not. But like for now, I think this is a really cool tool to like accelerate personal growth for other people and get them unlocked. And, you know, it like in what it did for me in terms of like getting me unstuck and rejuvenated and alive and all that, like, I think it can do that for a lot of people. In what ways did you feel like you were stuck before? Yeah. So, I mean, I was working out of my apartment, uh, pretty long hours. And some of that is just a function of, like I said, I was doing a lot of roles. Um, but I was working probably like 12 hour days out of my apartment, um, you know, forced myself to get up and like go to a coffee shop just to see other humans and have some interaction. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just, I, I feel like there were a lot of like interlocking gridlock there with, with like, I didn't have a huge social life at that point, And therefore it just wasn't like exercising. It wasn't like, you know, a lot of things just felt like they were locked up and 
doing the remote year thing and making that transition. And that just like gave me an instant social network and it got me out and walking around every day and exploring and getting energized and inspired by all these places. And it just like, it just felt like it unlocked all that. And so I don't know, like it, maybe, maybe I'm projecting what my issue was that others might be in that scenario. But I, I truly deep down think that there are a lot of people that don't know that this is a possibility. And so, and I think it is a possibility for a lot more people than they realize. Or that in some way they don't feel a sense of freedom or that they have, um, can take charge of their lives in that way. Yeah. That they're somehow like locked into a situation. Or sometimes like it's that boiling frog thing, right? Like sometimes you just don't even know that you're boiling because you've been like slowly heating up the water temperature the whole time. Right. And like, I was at least conscious, like, yeah, this sucks. I need to change something. And this sounds like an amazing way to do it. And it, it worked. Um, but I think there, there could be a lot of people that just don't realize they're boiling. So I totally get that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, that's a really good way to put it. Because I, I know that there have been times like just in the path of the entrepreneur, you know, where you're like so passionate and so creative and this is just so on fire. And like pretty soon you're just like, I am so freaking burnt out. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're just like grinding, grinding and you realize, wait a minute, yeah. what am I doing? Let's change something <laughs> about this, right? Like when your physical body starts to feel like, wait a minute, something's not right here. Okay. One last thing I thought of, any advice that you would recommend for folks who have families? Because I can imagine like, you know, I have two kids, you know, that's not possible. Like, yeah. have you seen anybody... I know it exists out there, but yeah. like folks who just kind of pick up their whole family and do something similar. Yeah. So I don't know of a formal program. Remote Year doesn't accommodate families yet. And I think they will someday. If they don't, someone will. Like hands down, this that is absolutely something. And it'll be amazing. Um, it's funny. I was just talking to a buddy about this, but like imagine the upbringing of, you know, if you're a kid and this is how you grew up and like the other kids that you would travel the world with, you would just inherently become best friends. There's no way you're not going to know those kids the rest of your life. It's like, <clears throat> it's like better than being in an international school. You're in an international family, but then you also get to travel. Yeah. This rotating international <laughs> school of life all over the world. I like, I think it would be an incredible upbringing. Um, my advice to families is yes, you can absolutely do it. I think you can, uh, there's a guy actually locally, Scott Kate did it with his family uh, here in Phoenix. I think he's somewhere in like either Central or South America at this point, but they've moved every three months. Oh, wow. Took his whole family and his kids are homeschooled now and they're traveling and he has his business that he started. And I mean, I just think, wow, what an incredible upbringing. Um, but I, I don't have any advice in terms of like do this specific program. I think yep. it's more like find other people that are in your boat. Maybe you could do it with another family and that would make it a little bit more um, you know, bearable and easier to do the homeschooling stuff but yeah well in some ways it seems like you know we have certain advantages like you know the strong dollar or being like when you're working remotely you're being paid in u.s dollars right but if you're living in a country where the dollar stretches pretty far right i mean when i was living in mexico i knew a fellow who he had retired and he just lived in mexico because his dollar stretched so much further yeah. so in some ways i think people think oh travel is so expensive it's so expensive i can't afford it but when you're actually living in a place, it can actually be more affordable. Oh, absolutely. And especially as you look at, you look at like rents in San Francisco and oh New York, God. you know, oh and God. like some of these places, you know, the, the folks in our group, we had people from New York. They're like, yeah, I'm banking money and I'm traveling the world. I'm saving from what I was paying on rent in New York. And I have like all my activities covered now. And like, it's just, it's a no brainer for folks in those areas. Um, so yeah, there's absolutely, they call it geo arbitrage, I think, is where you can get paid in your currency, but then live in another currency. Geo arbitrage. Something, yeah, geo arbitrage <laughs> or something like that. Okay, so we'll put all the links in the blog post, but um, for remote year and then um, for your e-course. Yep. Uh, any last words of wisdom? Uh, no, just if you're listening and this is something that appeals to you, you know, there's a lot of people there's a lot of programs, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of resources. Uh, I encourage you to just go investigate it. And Oh, and, one last question. Yeah, yeah. Age. Age, like, all over the map. All over the map. So yeah, you're 18, you're 55, you're 68, and you just retired. You're yep. Our group, I think the oldest person, we had like a 55-year-old guy. There's a group that had like a 68-year-old woman in theirs um, all the way down. I think the youngest in our group was a 23-year-old guy. So you have this wide age range. Um, Healthy. Yeah, it was super cool. Like the diversity, not just age range, but 
you know, obviously your, your uh, nationality, your uh, sexual orientation, your age, like all these factors, your profession, you just had this incredible diversity, this motley crew of people that you would never, <laughs> ever suspect would ever be put together for some reason. But it, this is like glommed together traveling for a year. It was just, it was amazing for that reason. I hope they never like screw up the diversity component of it because that was like the magical aspect. Wow. That sounds so amazing. Yeah. Well, we'll put all those links in from people. And then I'd love to, if you can share the link of the 365 days of seconds. I will. Yeah, I'll dig, I'll dig that up. So amazing. Thank you so much for being with us, John. Yeah, it was time. great catching up. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to The Flower Lounge. I'm Katie Hess, and we'll be releasing a new podcast every Wednesday. If you like what you heard or you know someone who might be touched by our conversation, share it with them. And don't forget to subscribe. To find out what your favorite flowers mean about you, take the quiz at lotusway.com.